Hi, and welcome back to Can You Relate? Thinking with Keywords for Culture. This episode highlights positionality and intersectionality. Hey Grace, I was wondering, have you ever thought about how your identity affects how you experience and view the world? Wow, Megan, that was a deep question. What do you mean? I mean, have you ever thought about positionality and intersectionality? Thanks, now I know exactly what you mean. (laughs) Well, first let's think about all your intersectional identities, which are the qualities or backgrounds that make you who you are. Do you think you can name five? Okay, well, I'm a white, straight, cisgender female, I'm an American, and I'm a college student. Great! Well, to start off, positionality refers to how differences in social position and power shape identities and access in society, while intersectionality refers to understanding all the things that make you you and affect how you are perceived in the world. Basically, they are two different contexts through which you can look at intersectional identity. While positionality emphasizes the power dynamics in identity, intersectionality focuses on how you perceive the world and how the world perceives you. Okay, so let me get this straight. My intersectional identity affects my access to power and privilege, as well as how I experience the world and how others perceive me. Wow, this is a lot to think about. Exactly, yeah. You may not be able to see it in all situations, but being white and straight, for example, affords you a certain level of privilege, while being female can put you in an inferior power position. For example, if you're in a sorority meeting with all girls, you may not even be conscious of your gender. However, if you are a female STEM student in a class of all boys, you not only recognize your identity more easily, you would understand your perceived inferiority compared to the others in the class. Oh my gosh, I never thought of this before. How else does it affect me? Well, we can start by debriefing your intersectional identity so you can better understand your social position in society. First of all, you identified yourself as white. Being white comes with a lot of privilege. You also identified as straight. This is also going to shape how you experience the world and are perceived differently than someone who identifies with the LGBTQ plus community. Lastly, you identified as female, which in one way or another makes you more vulnerable to being treated differently. Every part of your personal identity and positionality affects how you move through the world as well as your perspective of it. That's not to say that everyone with very similar intersectional identities are the same or have the same views. It simply means that they share experiences as members of certain groups that others may not. Okay, I have a question. Does your intersectional identity always stay the same? Oh no, not at all, but good question. In fact, your positionality will change at some point in your life more likely than not. For example, your socioeconomic status may change. As a teen, you may have relied on your parents for food, your home, health insurance, phone bill, and car. However, when you graduate college and get a job, you may be on your own in terms of paying for all those things and have newfound financial responsibility. Okay, I get it. I should reevaluate my positionality and intersectionality based on the context in which I'm living at the current time. Yes, and keep in mind too that it is so important not only to understand your own, but also that of other people. By understanding what they experience and what makes them who they are, you gain a better appreciation for them and insight into their perspective of the world. Well, I'm thinking about volunteering with the ESOL initiative this semester, so maybe being aware of positionality and intersectionality will better prepare me for that experience. Yes, being aware of both those identities is an important tool to help you prepare for work with diverse populations, whether that be for a career in the future or volunteering in the local community. For example, if you are working with a student who just moved from Russia and didn't know English and the context of intersectionality, they would face very different obstacles and judgments than if they were English-speaking U.S. citizens. In contrast, in the context of positionality, they would have less access to power and privileges compared to another American student because they don't have a U.S. passport or English fluidity. All right, and now let's talk to Sandra Lopez uh, to understand how positionality and intersectionality affects the experience of the student. Welcome, Sandra. Thanks for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, of course. We are too. Uh, So first of all, how would you describe your intersectional identity? I would say that I'm a Latina activist, um, POC, that feels and sees the um, the emotional aspects of systematic racism within education. 
perfect yeah um and you know going off of that identity as you said how do you think that growing up as a student um you were treated differently because of um your identity and the things you identify with well first i went to basically an all-white high school in woodruff south carolina and I would say that I wasn't even acknowledged. Like they just saw me as another person. Um, even in the classroom with teachers, like nothing came up about race or anything. I was always the only person of color in the room. Um, so with that being said, I kind of hid my identity too because it wasn't talked about and it wasn't brought up until like I got home and even then like since I was around a bunch of white people, like I would also try to hide that at home. Like I wouldn't speak Spanish sometimes um, to my parents. I would just speak English. When do you think the the transition happened between almost like concealing your identity and then um, like letting it come out and talking about it um, more and being an activist? Like you said, like was that transition in college or or when yeah, did that it was happen? Yeah, in college because. When I got here, my, my roommate, she's black. Um, and through those conversations, we just kind of build off of each other. And we kind of had the same experiences in high school too. Um, so just from that, you know, I kind of learned a lot more and I was like, whoa, what a, <laughs> who am I? And so I changed a full 360, my mentality. And then um, I'm also a Bonner Scholar, so I was heavily involved with the community and just seeing that also shifted my thought and my perception. I gotcha. Um, and, you know, speaking of volunteering and the community, why do you think it would be important for volunteers to be aware of their positionality and their identity as it pertains to privilege or lack thereof um, as they go out and prepare to work with students or, or kids around the area? I think when you're working with children, any adult or like older person within their lives has a big impact on where they're going to go. So just understanding like if a child is sad and they just don't feel like participating at all, when a teacher or a tutor or someone kind of forces that upon them, it gives them a bad taste of education systems and just acknowledging that and taking that into consideration can really help the children grow and have that relationship to where there's trust within the older people that are coming to help the children and the children themselves. Perfect. I think that's really some valuable advice. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Not only will being aware of your positionality and intersectionality help prepare you for engagement in the local community, but also abroad. Well, what do you mean? Well, being American is an intersectional identity that comes with a lot of privilege and power. Why don't you talk to Dr. Buffet to hear about her experience? So, when I was a junior at Wofford, as a psychology and Spanish major, I had to study abroad. As I was weighing my options of where I might go, my advisor suggested that I consider the Dominican Republic because, as she put it, she thought it would be interesting for me to see what it would be like to live as part of the majority instead of part of the minority. I was terrified in general about the idea of going abroad, and the Dominican Republic was one of the closest abroad destinations. And while I had not thought much about the concepts of race and identity, I did find the idea of living as part of the majority appealing. So that is where I decided to go for my study abroad experience, imagining that we would all live in some kind of brown harmony together there. Once I got there, however, I found that I could not have been more wrong about living in brown harmony. After I arrived, it didn't take me long to figure out that Dominicans, who tend to have lighter complexions or lighter skin, to put it nicely, are not always kind to and tend to regularly discriminate against Haitians who tend to have darker complexions and be of darker skin. I was a medium brown color upon arrival and after walking around in the blazing sun for the first couple of weeks, I began to tan so my skin tone got darker. 
As a result, I was regularly mistaken for being Haitian, which often meant dealing with discrimination and mistreatment. I lived in a neighborhood with two other African-American students and a Caucasian student, all from the United States. The other two African-American students were also of a medium brown complexion, so they dealt with the same things that I did in being mistaken for being Haitian. Well, the four of us did everything together, which included walking to the university every day together and traveling. Dominicans in general seem very interested in getting to know and hanging out with students from the United States, but because my friends and I were brown, we were not readily identified as being from the United States, as Dominicans seemed to have the idea that students from the United States were white and blonde. This whole thing was really tricky to understand and navigate because it had not occurred to me that because I was brown, people there would assume that I could not be from the United States. So this was confusing to me and also confusing for Dominicans, and the situation really came to a head during a bus trip that I took with my friends. We arrived late to the bus station, so we had to buy tickets separate from each other and sit with people that we didn't know. I ended up beside a young girl who was about the same color as me. And during the bus ride, her friend, who was sitting towards the front of the bus, came to talk to her. I was in the aisle seat, and I was surprised that the girl regularly invaded my space and pushed up against me as she talked over me to her friend, who was in the window seat. Their conversation was in Spanish, so I could understand them. And at some point, the girl talking over me asked her friend who I was. And the girl responded, oh, I don't know some Haitian. Without giving it much thought, I responded in Spanish, I'm not Haitian, I'm American. The girl who had been standing and talking over me did not say another word. She did not pass go, she did not collect $200. She immediately returned to her seat. The girl sitting next to me did not say another word either. I couldn't believe it. I was astounded that just like that, just by identifying myself as American instead of Haitian, it completely changed that whole dynamic. It was a very eye-opening experience, and it really made me start thinking about what it meant to be American outside of the United States and the, for lack of a better word, power of what it meant being from the United States. That situation also helped me to understand and realize that even though I was often mistaken for being Haitian and therefore mistreated, there were times when it was advantageous for people to think that I was Dominican, and there were other times when it was definitely advantageous for people to know that I was from the United States. It was a very tricky situation to navigate, but there were lots of valuable lessons learned. It is so interesting to hear about Dr. Bethay's experience in the Dominican Republic. The first time I heard it, I was absolutely blown away. For one, she has a perfect example of how positionality changes. In the United States, she was part of a racial minority, but a part of the majority in terms of language and citizenship. However, in the Dominican Republic, she became part of the racial majority, gained power and privilege by being an English-speaking American, and face discrimination because of how the world perceived her as being Haitian. Hearing your story was really impactful for me too. I think there were two reasons for that. One, upon reflecting on her story, I realized that we make false assumptions all the time, myself included. Sometimes I don't even realize it, but I have to make an effort to catch myself. And two, assumptions aren't just thoughts that stay in your head. They influence our thinking, which affect our feelings and attitudes, therefore guiding our actions. Everything is connected. If my actions are based in inaccurate assumptions, then I'm not living in truth at all. Wow, that's so true. And I think that's why it's so important to understand intersectionality and positionality. By learning about these ideas and identifying them in everyday life, we are affecting both ourselves and the people around us. As you have probably already guessed, positionality and intersectionality are very deeply related. I think I get it now. So once you understand someone's positionality, you can begin to understand the obstacles and discrimination they face because of their intersectionality, correct? Exactly. And that is not necessarily an easy thing to do, especially if you cannot identify with someone else's identity, even in part, 
It is so important to dig deeper and educate yourself on the challenges others face simply based on who they are and their relation to the world. Sometimes we are in a position of power based on our race, class, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, nationality, education, upbringing, or even zip code. It may be uncomfortable to acknowledge and learn about privilege we may not even realize, but that makes educating yourself and attempting to understand all the more important. As college students, we use our positionality to uplift others through listening, being open to diverse perspectives, being weary of making automatic assumptions, and being committed to learning from others. Before we go, we challenge you to take a few minutes to reflect on a couple points so that you may better have insight into yourself and the people around you, as you are all related to and interconnected with the world. First, reflect upon a time when you noticed that you were treated differently because of your intersectional identity, either positively or negatively. Then, reflect upon a time where you noticed others were being treated differently because of their intersectional identities. Thank Thank you. you!